Hi folks, my name is Monica and I'm the Conservation Project Manager for the Lake George Land Conservancy. I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in for our um, second recorded presentation of this season's Living Land series. Um, just as a reminder, all of these will be recorded um, and saved on our YouTube channel. So if you have a conflict, but there was an event that you really wanted to watch, um, you can always tune in later. And if there was um, an event that you thought was really interesting and you want to watch a second time, it'll be there for you to enjoy uh, time and time again. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Charlotte Malmborg, who is the Education and Outreach Coordinator for the New York State Hemlock Initiative. Uh, Charlotte has come out a number of times to the Lake George area to talk about Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. She's really an expert um, and we really value and appreciate having her here. Um, thanks also to the entire lab out at Cornell University. Um, the New York State Hemlock Initiative has been a wonderful partner to the LGLC and has really helped us uh, every step along the way um, as we work to monitor for and manage any infestations of Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. So HWA, um, Charlotte will talk about this in great detail, but HWA uh, is a tiny but very destructive invasive forest pest. It kills hemlock trees and because of the important role that hemlocks play in protecting water quality and also because of the high density of hemlocks in the Lake George watershed, um, the LGLC has made it one of our priorities when we stored our lands to look out for HWA and check hemlock health. Um, every winter, our land stored Alex walks many, many miles looking for signs of active HWA um, and also looking for damage to hemlocks and any signs um, that hemlocks are sick, potentially due to HWA. Um, and then every spring, we're lucky enough to go out on the water. LGLC staff and some volunteers will head out uh, onto Lake George. And from a distance um, on the boat, we look for signs of new growth on hemlocks, um, which is just a way to verify that hemlock trees are healthy. Charlotte will talk about that in detail as well. Um, any trees that don't look healthy from a distance, that don't have a beautiful green color, uh, we get a little bit closer and we look at why that might be. I'm happy to say that so far Alex hasn't found any signs of HWA on the land um, and we haven't seen any signs from the water either. Um, of course we recognize that we are not going to be able to see everything uh, which is why we also work um, through events and just through educating folks um, to encourage as many people as possible to get out onto the land and to keep their eyes on hemlock health. Um, every, every winter, every hunting season, uh, we keep in touch and send materials to about 70 hunters um, who hunt LGLC lands and lands that don't belong to LGLC. Um, but we always provide uh, informational and identification materials to those hunters and although we have, we've only ever heard back that no one has seen signs of HWA, but every year the majority of our hunters do report back a few times a year just to say that they're keeping their eyes open and that they have yet to see any signs of HWA. Um, we also do educational events. Uh, sometimes we'll have Charlotte come in um, earlier this year in March, LGLC partnered uh, with our land trust neighbors, Saratoga Plan. Um, we did an indoor presentation uh, with an outdoor component uh, in which we monitored with a group of volunteers, Saratoga Plan's Hennig Preserve. Um, we spent a few hours out on the land, again, just looking for signs of HWA, and we didn't find anything. Uh, but now we have another group of avid hikers who are going to be on uh, Saratoga Plans lands, on LGLC lands, and again beyond, um, who will keep their eyes open for HWA, know what to look for, and know uh, how to report their findings, just like you all will know at the end of this presentation. Um, so again, I wanna thank you all for becoming part of this, um, for learning about HWA, and for wanting to get involved. Um, and I think I've been blabbering on for long enough, so without Further ado, I'm gonna let Charlotte take it away um, to talk about Hemlock Woolly Adelgid and uh, 
and hemlocks in general. Hi, everybody. I'd like to welcome you all to Conserving the Foundation. And this is going to be a presentation about keeping hemlock trees healthy in Adirondack forests. So I just want to introduce myself today. My name is Charlotte Malmborg, and I'm the New York State Hemlock Initiative's Education and Outreach Coordinator. The New York State Hemlock Initiative is a group from Cornell University's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Today I'm going to talk about hemlock woolly adelgid and invasive forest pest. I just want to point out our partners today uh, for this webinar. First, it is really, really wonderful to be invited to be part of the Living Land Series from Lake George Land Conservancy. So I'd like to thank LGLC for having us and hosting us for this webinar. I'd also like to mention our statewide partners at the New York Department of Environmental Conservation, as well as our national partners uh, at the Forest Service, the USDA APHIS program, and the EPA. We also work really closely with many organizations around the Adirondacks, most notably the Adirondack Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. So today, the, during this webinar, I'm going to talk about hemlock trees. And I'm going to talk about the major threat to hemlocks in New York, the hemlock woolly adelgid. And I'm going to start by talking about hemlock tree identification. One of the things I want at the end of this webinar is for everybody to be able to leave, go outside, and identify hemlock trees for themselves. So I'm going to go through some of the key identifiable features of hemlock trees. I'm going to start by talking about their bark. Hemlocks have pretty distinctive bark. It's typically very rough in texture. It's got these deep striated furrows that create this fissured scaly appearance. And it's typically brown. When hemlocks are more immature, younger, they typically have more grayish brown uh, bark. However, when hemlock trees get older or more mature, the red inner bark starts to show through in those furrows. So you'll, it will end up having a more reddish brown appearance. As for the foliage, you'll be looking for a tree that has kind of a lacy, feathery texture for its foliage. And it's evergreen, so you can see the green needles of hemlock trees all year round. It's actually really easy to find hemlock trees during the winter when deciduous trees have lost their leaves because they're one of the only green things on the landscape. When we're talking about key identifiable features of hemlocks, the needles are one of the best ways to tell this tree apart from others. You'll be looking for a tree with short needles, typically about half an inch to three quarters of an inch long, and the needles will be flat, which is pretty unique to hemlock trees and balsam fir in the Adirondacks, but typically uh, a pine or a spruce tree is gonna have needles with a profile that allows you to roll them between your fingers. So if you see a tree, an evergreen tree, you pick out one of those needles and you can't roll it between your fingers, you might be dealing with a hemlock tree. They have a shiny dark green color on the top and rounded tips. So a spruce tree or some pines have more pointed tips. Hemlock trees, on the other hand, have blunt tips at the ends of their needles. They're also arranged opposite each other on the twig, kind of across each other. Um, on, on that twig. And they've got two distinct white stripes on the undersides of twigs, which is a really great key identifiable feature of hemlock. If the cones are present, you'll be looking for cones that are quite small, about three quarters of an inch to an inch in length. They've got rounded scales, and they're typically this nice light brown color. And that's when they're mature. When hemlock cones are immature, they're going to look like tiny green footballs. And next, I'm going to talk about hemlock trees distribution and density in New York. One thing to note from this map, this is showing the density of hemlock and, and its locations throughout New York. And you'll notice right away that the areas with the highest density of hemlock trees are right here in the Adirondacks, concentrated in this neck of the woods. You'll also find a lot of hemlock trees in the Tug Hill Plateau region, just west of the Adirondacks as well as in the Catskills. However, hemlocks are very common 
They're actually the third most common tree species in New York. So they're, you can find them almost anywhere. In addition to being common, hemlock trees are also critically important to New York's ecology and the forests of New York. And they're so important that we call them a foundation species, which means they create the unique environment that they live in. And so hemlocks act as habitat building blocks, and they do this in several different ways. And I'm going to talk about four major ways that hemlock trees contribute to New York's ecology. First, hemlock trees fill a very specific forest niche, meaning that they grow in places that other tree species do not grow, do not like to grow, don't grow well. So since they fill this really specific forest niche, places like steep slopes or shadier areas, they're a very shade tolerant tree, hemlocks are essentially irreplaceable on the landscape because nothing else is going to come in and fill that niche if the hemlocks aren't there. Second, they provide, they support the entire base of the food web because they provide both habitat and a food source for over 400 forest species. And this includes everything from birds to mammals and all the species of arthropods, so spiders and insects that live in the trees and provide food for other larger organisms. They're a really excellent winter food source for deer, moose, and porcupines. And there are a lot of nesting and migrating bird species that rely on hemlock trees throughout their life cycle. Hemlocks also provide unique ecosystem services that help us survive in New York as well. A huge one is that they help contribute to keeping freshwater streams cold and clean. Hemlocks have a really shallow branching root system that helps act as a natural filter as fresh water approaches streams and, and rivers in New York. And it also helps keep water cold through direct shade. Since hemlocks have their needles all year round, throughout the winter when snow accumulates, that snow melts much slower under a hemlock canopy that's really, really shady. And that slow progressive snow melt keeps streams colder longer throughout the year. Hemlocks also help create unique habitats in New York. And a lot of these habitats have very distinct soil and water chemistry and temperature regimes. So they create these little microcosms, pockets of habitat where distinct charismatic species can live. And this includes species like brook trout um, and other fishes, as well as special plant species that grow in the unique soil chemistry conditions that hemlocks create. And these small microcosm habitats help enhance the biodiversity of New York's forests, and hemlocks support all that. So hopefully I've convinced you by now that hemlock trees are definitely worth saving as a foundation species. But in addition to being so important ecologically in New York, hemlocks are also a part of us. They're a part of the fabric that makes New York's forests so special to live in and play in. And so I really wanna bring up the concept of forest stewardship. And that's that we have a unique responsibility to take care of hemlock trees the way that they take care of us. This is especially critical if you're a landowner. And that's because landowners own 76 of New York percent of New York's forested lands. And so landowners play an outside role in forest stewardship because they are taking care of most of New York's forested lands. And ultimately, we really don't want our forests to look anything like this. So this is a picture of what losing hemlock trees on the landscape looks like. As I mentioned, hemlocks are a really, really common species. And so if we have a forest that is 75 to 85 or even 90% hemlock trees, we could end up with spots of forests that look a lot like this, just these dead matchstick trees um, lining our rivers over our mountains. And we really don't want the beautiful, pristine Adirondacks to look anything like this. So this photo was taken in the Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina. And in the Southern Appalachians, Hemlock Woolly Adelgid really did a number on a lot of the forests down there. 
The original infestations on the East Coast were found in Virginia near Richmond, and it spread really, really rapidly through the Southern Adirondack, or excuse me, Southern Appalachians, and north towards Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York. So now I'm going to address this threat, this insect pest, the hemlock woolly adelgid. It is an invasive pest of hemlock trees uh, that has been infesting hemlocks since the 1980s in New York. And I'd like to frame the problem of HWA in the context of its native range. So HWA is a hemlock pest, but it is considered a native pest in a lot of areas where hemlock trees exist. So there are several places throughout the world where hemlock trees are native. And there, with many of those hemlock species, HWA is considered a native pest. And that includes all of the species of hemlock tree that are found in Asia, as well as the two hemlock species that are found on the west coast of North America. So in all these places, HWA is considered a native pest because there are natural systems in place that keep the populations of HWA in check and keep it from causing widespread hemlock mortality. Unfortunately, there are two species that are very susceptible to succumbing to HWA infestations. And that includes Suga canadensis, the eastern hemlock, or the hemlock tree that we have here in New York, and Suga caroliniana, which is a hemlock species that is found in the southern Appalachians. And hemlock woolly adelgid in the U.S. has, or on the east coast of the U.S., I should say, has an interesting history. And a lot of the work that's been done on this pest has been done by the U.S. Forest Service. And I want to bring up a very specific study during this time, and that's a study that determined that the hemlock trees, or the hemlock woolly adelgid that we have on our hemlock trees here on the East Coast, originated in southern Japan. And we know this because the study was done by Dr. Nathan Havel with the U.S. Forest Service. And what Dr. Havel found after looking at the genetic signatures of hemlock woolly adelgid around the world was that the hemlock woolly adelgid here on the East Coast most closely matched the HWA that was found in Southern Japan. And so it's likely that the hemlock woolly adelgid that we have here in New York and along the East Coast came in on infested nursery stock on Asian hemlock trees that were planted here on the East Coast and hopped ship and got onto one of our native hemlock trees here and was able to spread that way. Again, the original infestations occurred near Richmond, Virginia. So now I'll talk a little bit about how HWA has spread in New York. As I mentioned earlier, HWA came to New York in the 1980s and it entered through New York City to Long Island region. And since this is an area that experiences a lot of trade, a lot of development and a lot of human traffic and movement, it is likely that infested nursery stock was one of the original ways that HWA made it to New York. By the late 1980s, HWA had reached the Catskills and it has continued to spread from that point both west towards the Finger Lakes, which it reached in 2008, and also north into the Capital Region. But there are two really specific uh, sightings I want to talk about today. The first is the sighting that occurred in 2017 in Warren County. And this was the first Adirondack infestation of HWA. It's also currently the only Adir known infestation in the Adirondacks so far. So one of the things that's really wonderful about this story is that right now there are, we currently have no active infestations in the Adirondacks. Once this sighting was made and the because the person who found this particular HWA infestation reported it so quickly, in a few months, the DEC was able to survey the area really, really well, map out and make a treatment plan for the region and then treat those trees. So effectively, we have no HWA infestations present that we know of in the Adirondacks. However, there was a recent sighting this past year 
in Fulton County, just south of the Adirondacks. So while the 2020 sighting in Fulton County was outside the blue line of the Adirondacks, it is extremely close to the Southern Appalachian or Southern Adirondack forests. And so it's a really, really concerning infestation. And hopefully what that means is that we will be able to increase our surveys and hopefully get a clearer picture of what's going on in this leading edge. So the Southern Adirondacks, anywhere where uh, Lake George Land Conservancy has its service area, these are key areas for HWA infestation sightings and surveys. And hopefully these stories can help serve to underline and emphasize the value of early detection. So if we find HWA infestations, report them to the right folks, that means that we can have a rapid response to those infestations, get them treated, and help slow the spread in this region. Next, I'm going to talk about Hemophilia delgid identification and biology. So when you're looking for HWA, what you're looking for usually is these white, waxy, woolly masses that appear along hemlock twigs. And where you'll find them is right along that woody tissue because that's where they're feeding. They feed directly from the woody tissue of the hemlock tree. And so you'll find them right up against the twig near the base of the needles. And ultimately, it's this feeding that damages the hemlock twig tissue and causes the eventual decline and death of the hemlock tree. Hemlock woolly adelgid feeds from this piercing, sucking, straw-like mouth part. And so you can imagine, with all these tiny little pierced wounds that are occurring along a twig, if populations of HWA get high enough, all that damage ends up blocking the flow of water and nutrients to the ends of the buds, and the tree can't put on any new growth, and so it effectively starves to death. This process takes about four to 20 years. So in New York here, where winters are cooler and there's, time, there's times where HWA dies back during really cold snaps in the winter, this process is typically closer to six to 20 years. However, Southern Appalachians, it, looked, it was closer to four to 10 years that it took to kill trees since they have such milder winters. Since we're experiencing some milder winters in the past few years, we might be able to see our timeline shift closer to that four to 10 year range. And so it's really, really critical to keep an eye on the trees. And once those infestations take root to act and, and treat those trees. Next, I'm going to talk about HWA phenology and spread. So the phenology uh, refers to the timing of HWA's major life cycle stages. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, the phenology of HWA, and I'm going to start by introducing the fact that HWA has two generations per year. And so this is a really important thing about their life cycle. First, they have a long overwintering systems generation, which is followed by a much shorter spring generation or the Pergidians generation. So as you can see, during the systems and Pergidians generation, both of these generations go through an egg stage, hatching into crawlers. Then they go through four instars, where they are nymphs and then become adults. And the adults lay the eggs of the next generation. So now I'm going to go through each of those in a little more detail. So when HWA eggs hatch, they hatch into what is known as their crawler stage. And the crawlers are the most mobile stage of HWA. Since HWA feeds through that piercing, sucking, straw-like mouth part, once it inserts that mouth part into the twig, it doesn't move from that spot, and it continues feeding at that one spot throughout the rest of its life cycle. However, once they hatch from eggs into crawlers, crawlers are the only time that HWA is mobile and actively looking for a spot to insert its mouth parts. And so that's the stage where you want to be really careful about moving branches or making sure that you clean your gear after you come in from a hike. 
uh, during that time from April to June, because that's when HWA is going to be laying eggs and crawlers are going to be active. Once crawlers settle during the cistins generation, they become estivating nymphs. And estivation is a period of summer dormancy. So the crawlers settle on the twig, and by settle, I mean they insert their mouth parts into the twig. And during the cistins generation, those crawlers take a little break and go into dormancy between July and October. And throughout this time, they're not feeding or developing, but they're just sitting there on the twig. The pervidians, on the other hand, begin feeding immediately once the, the crawlers settle. So this is what it looks like on the twig, and I do want to point out that you can find HWA all year round, although it's much easier to find when they have that woolly body covering. You can see the estivating nymphs during the summer months. What you'll be looking for is these tiny sesame seed shaped individuals surrounded by a thin halo of white wool. While both of these photos are under a microscope, I can see them if I get really close to a twig, I can see them with my naked eye. Uh, but it really helps to bring a hand lens or a magnifying glass into the field if you're going to be looking kind of between Jul July and October. Nymphs, either after estivation or right after they settle in the case of the second generation, begin to feed, grow, and produce wool. And this is taking place between November and June. So it's about November through April for the systems generation and April through June for the Pergridians generation. Adults lay 50 to 100 eggs each. And in this photo, you can see uh, this adult body on the left of HWA, where we've pulled back the wool from that round body. You can see how much they've grown in that time from the little sesame seed shape. And then on the right, towards the right of that, just under the A of adults on this screen, you can see a little clutch of HWA. And this is taking place, the egg laying is taking place from April into May. So typically towards the end of March and early April, that's when the systems generation, that first generation lays their eggs. And then by the end of May, that's when the progridians generation has started to lay their eggs. And again, there are these two generations per year, egg into crawler, crawler into nymph, nymph to adult, and then back to eggs. And the one major difference between the two being the fact that the cistins generation has that long overwintering period during the summer and into the fall called estivation. What this looks like on the twig, and I'm gonna go through it one more time quickly, uh, because it really, ch it, it's interesting to see it in the context of what this looks like on a hemlock twig. So what you'll see is those cistins will settle and then during the fall and winter, they'll accumulate their wool. And then once the cistins adults lay their eggs and the pergridians hatch, the pergridians crawlers will settle amongst their mothers on that same section of twig. And so what you'll get is the section of twig that is getting a whole lot of damage from both the first, and genera the first generation and second generation of HWA. Since the tree hasn't put on any of its new spring growth yet. And you also get this section of twig where you might see all generations of HWA, all different times of, of life cycle on one section of twig. And then in the spring, the tree has put on its new growth. Once those progridians lay eggs, the crawlers of the second year's systems generation can immediately infest all of the new growth on the tree. And so it's really easy for infestations to spread quickly on a tree. And there are three major reasons that make HWA such an invasive insect. First is that they reproduce asexually. And what this means is it takes only one individual on a tree to start a new infestation. They have two generations per year, and so even if you get a situation with cold winters where some of the first generation gets knocked back, that spring generation ensures that the populations build right back up. And then we also have no native HWA predators here on the East Coast. And what this all means is that we basically have no natural HWA population control 
on the East Coast. And so next, I'm going to talk about the hopeful stuff, uh, HWA management. And so we do have ways of controlling HWA populations available to us now. And I'm going to talk about chemical control um, using pesticide treatment to uh, get rid of HWA infestations. And I'll also talk about biological control uh, using predator insects to manage HWA populations. So I'll start by talking about chemical control. And there are two different active ingredients that are used in products for treatment of HWA in New York. The first one I'm going to talk about is imidacloprid, which is the most common product that is used in New York to combat HWA infestations. And imidacloprid is a pretty slow acting um, active ingredient in the products that are used to treat HWA. So it usually takes imidacloprid um, about a year to become fully active in the canopy of a tree. However, it's very long lasting. So once a tree is treated with an imidacloprid product, it is protected from HWA infestations for up to seven years. And as far as we have seen, imidacloprid is 100% successful at treating hemlock woolly adelgid infestations on trees. The other active ingredient that's used in different treatment products is called dinotefuran. And this is a fast acting ingredient, so it's typically about three weeks to become fully active in the canopy. So it's really great for knocking out infestations fast. However, it has a short lifetime in the tree and only protects trees for a, a year. And in some cases, these products are applied together so that you get the fast acting benefits of dinotefuran combined with the long lasting benefits of imidacloprid. One really great thing about imidacloprid, however, is that it's widely available. So landowners can apply imidacloprid as a soil drench and apply it themselves on their own private property. However, dinotefuran is only available to certified pesticide applicators. In New York, the best management practice uh, for treatment of HWA is the basal bark application. Now, basal bark application is an application of the pesticide product being applied directly to the bark of the tree. It's considered the best management practice because it's avoiding putting any product in the soil and is especially much safer near waterways. However, if you are a landowner who is considering treatment and wants to use a basal bark application, it is only available to certified applicators, uh, even if you're applying just a medical grid. One other thing I'd like to know is, and a, a question I get very often is, should I treat my trees preemptively? And I'll say that since it takes about four to 20 years to kill a tree that has an HWA infestation, I would say wait until you have an infestation present and you know there's an infestation there. Because HWA kind of is a spotty insect and it sometimes takes years to show up, even in places where there are a lot of highly infested areas, it's best to wait to treat and, and treat only when you know you have an infestation on a tree. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about imidacloprid in context. Imidacloprid is a really common agricultural pesticide. It's typically applied on crops, and that's a really different setting from a forest. So a crop setting is kind of one species of plant that's being treated, and it's being treated in a flat area, and it's being treated on a landscape that's very homogeneous. However, when we're applying it in the context of a forest setting, we're applying it in very different conditions, much more heterogeneous, and there's a lot more stuff going on in a forest setting. And so imidacloprid has been well studied in forest settings for the use of HWA management. And one thing that's really great about imidacloprid is that it reduces any off-target impacts because it's a pesticide designed to, um, designed to control insect pests. And since it's uh, part of this class of, of pesticides for treating insects, that helps reduce any impacts towards mammals or fish, other vertebrates, birds. Um, and so that helps limit bioaccumulation in the landscape. It's targeting just, just the HWA. 
it's a very low risk to pollinators. And that's because hemlock trees themselves are wind pollinated. So it's not only being applied in a low dose to kill this very small target insect, it's also being used on a plant that isn't going to attract any pollinating insects. So it's much safer to use around pollinators. And since it's long lasting, up to seven years in the tree, that reduces the need for reapplication. So you're not going in and spraying an area every single year. You're only going in after maybe five to seven years if you're going to reapply. And ultimately, although there's always risk to applying a pesticide in the ecosystem, in this case, there's also a risk to not treating. So treatment prevents that cascade of ecological effects that would come from losing a foundation species. There's also hope for biological control. So this is a really exciting prospect um, in, for New York and for the East Coast in general. And biocontrol represents a long-term solution to HWA management because, of course, after years and years and years, it doesn't become economical or ecologically feasible to continue to treat with pesticide over and over and over. So biological control is kind of a long-term sustainable option uh, that will allow HWA populations to be controlled over time. It's also landscape scale. So when we treat with pesticides, we can only treat individual trees one at a time. However, when you treat with biocontrol, even though you apply your biocontrol to just one tree, those insects that you release are not confined to that one tree. Um, and so they end up growing in population, establishing growing in population, and then spreading from that original release point. So it's a landscape scale solution as well. And research is still very, very much in progress, but we do have some success stories to share as well. So the New York State Hemlock Initiative, um, it works really, really hard on biological control research for HWA. Before I get into exactly what our lab is researching, I want to talk about the typical biocontrol research timeline. Since I get a lot of questions about how we know releasing biocontrols will be safe on the landscape. I want to talk a little bit about everything that went on behind the scenes way before we were allowed to release insects in New York. The first thing that biocontrol researchers do is research potential pest predators. So way before the release phase, they look at that pest's native range and they try to determine some predators that may be appropriate release, uh, appropriate for release in a new setting. And in this case, what we were looking for was something that would be prey specific. And so we were looking for predators that won't go after anything except HWA. Then after you do all your research, which typically takes about six years, uh, you want to obtain permits for predator release. Uh, so once you determine which predators you'd like to release, then you have to be permitted. And our lab is permitted on both the national level and the state level. So we had to present our research and get permission to actually release those insects um, to manage HWA populations. And only after those two things are accomplished, which can take many, many years, uh, that's when you can start releasing and doing continued research. So now I'm going to introduce you to the biocontrol agents that we are using to manage HWA populations in New York. And I'm going to start by talking about Laracobius nigrinus beetles. So little Larry is a beetle species from the Pacific Northwest. Again, that's a place where HWA is considered a native pest. And Laracobius beetles are a specialist feeder of HWA in that region. So that means that they're prey specific and they're evolved to only eat HWA just the same way that HWA is only evolved to eat from hemlock trees. And we've released over, not, well over 9,000, almost 10,000 beetles in New York. Um, and we've been releasing Laracobius beetles since 2008 in New York. So in addition to collecting 
beetles from the Pacific Northwest and releasing them in New York. We're also monitoring for establishment at previous release sites. And so I'll talk a little bit about that later. Next, I'm going to introduce you to our Leucopus silverflies. So our silverflies, we work with two very closely related species of these flies, Leucopus argenticollis and Leucopus peniperta. And Leucopus are maybe the most abundant predators of HWA, again, from the Pacific Northwest. And the larvae of these flies are what preys on HWA. So the larvae eat the HWA eggs, which is really great. So in the case of the Laracobius beetles, the beetles are feeding on growing and developing um, adults and nymphs of HWA. However, the Leucopus silverflies uh, those larvae go after the eggs of HWA. So we have two different predators that are feeding on two different life cycle stages of HWA. So they're complementing each other rather than competing for resources. And we've released over 10,000 beetles in New York. And that number is actually wrong. Um, I should have updated it for this presentation. We've released uh, over 17,000 beetles uh, in New York, counting the releases that just completed this spring season. And what we're doing, some of the research projects that we're doing with Laracobius beetles include collecting and releasing the flies from the, so collecting them in the Pacific Northwest and then releasing them across New York State. We're also developing lab rearing techniques and determining if we can rear these flies successfully in the lab. And that includes things like making sure that we can provide them with the right food sources and helping them um, go into dormancy during times when we cannot provide them with food. And so we're working on ways that we can adjust their temperature and feeding regimes uh, to keep fly colonies in the lab. We're completing genetic analyses to learn more about these flies and investigating niche separation. So we, as I mentioned, we work with two very closely related silver fly species and we're looking at understanding how they separate into different niches when they're in the field. And now I'm going to talk about two really great biocontrol success stories. The first is that we released over 7,000 silver flies this year during the 2020 season. And that was really exciting because we knew going into this coronavirus pandemic that we were going to have a more difficult time. But luckily, we were supported by wonderful colleagues in Washington, British Columbia, and at the State University in, of North Dakota to help us get some silver flies and release them here in New York. We also had our beetles established at five different sites. So we've been going back and monitoring for beetle establishment. Um, and so far, we have found that there are five established populations of Laracobius beetles. While this is really, really good news, I will reiterate that biocontrol is a long-term project. It takes a lot of effort to be able to do all this research and build up these populations in the field. And so although biocontrol has seen some really excellent successes in New York State, I would like to remind everybody that treatment really is the best option for saving hemlock genetic diversity in the short term. So in addition to researching biological control, the New York State Hemlock Initiative is also doing some research on HWA to continue to build our knowledge base. One of the most important projects that we have is that we are observing HWA phenology or the timing of those major life cycle stages in New York. This ties in really nicely with our biocontrol program. So to release biocontrols in the field, we have to know that HWA is in the proper life cycle stage for them to begin feeding. Otherwise, they won't have any food available. Uh, so we have volunteers and our staff uh, looking very closely at HWA phenology. And the two most important life cycle stages for us are the estivation break, so when those cystins break their period of summer dormancy in the fall and begin feeding, because that's when we know it's time to release our beetles. And then we also look at egg laying in the spring. Um, the timing of those egg laying means that's the time that we can release leucopus silverflies in the field. 
In addition to observing HWA phenology, we're also monitoring HWA winter mortality. So we have a few warmer sites in New York, warmer winter sites, so a few in the Finger Lakes, and we have some colder winter sites in the Catskills, and we take samples from each and we compare how many individuals survive after major cold events. And what we found is that typically the colder winter sites do have greater mortality after super cold events in New York. And so we think so far based on our, our preliminary data that those sudden cold snaps after HWA has had a few days to acclimate to say a balmy 28 degrees and then it's suddenly negative 15. Those are the times when HWA is hit the hardest and we see the greatest amount of HWA death during that time. However, again, since HWA has two generations per year, spring generations bring populations back up, even though that HWA winter mortality does slow the spread a little bit. We are working really hard to identify biocontrol release sites. And so we look for places where hemlocks are relatively healthy, but there are still large populations of HWA in order to feed our biocontrol bugs. And so these are really specific sites where the infestation is at just the right time, where the trees are still relatively healthy for a few years. That'll give those biocontrols some time to build up their populations. And we're also looking at using imaging techniques to observe what's happening in the twig and see the tree damage right up close, uh, seeing what HWA is doing to twigs. We have a few future directions for our research I'm going to talk about, but very quickly, I want to draw your attention to the right um, at this photo. Uh, what you're seeing here in the middle is with that yellow body in the dark middle. That's um, one of those very tiny leucopus silverfly larva going to town on some HWA. And so now I'll talk about some future directions for our research. And this includes using eDNA to confirm predator establishment in the field. So right now we have some very loose methods of finding biocontrols in the field after we release them. In the case of beetles, we use a beet sheet method. And so what we do is we take a canvas sheet, whack the hemlock branches in the area where we release them, and see if any beetles fall into that canvas sheet underneath, uh, underneath the branch. In this case, it's not a very detailed or and, and sometimes not very accurate reporting metric. So even though we've been able to find predators, those, those beetles at five different sites, we think that we can detect them a little bit better if we try some different and more refined methods. So right now we are working to develop uh, techniques for using eDNA um, to collect eDNA and try to analyze it in the lab. Uh, so although we haven't deployed any sen sensors yet for detecting eDNA in the field, uh, this is what we're working towards and hopefully it will be able to help us more easily confirm if beetles or flies are surviving and reproducing in the field. We're also working with a Cornell University Department of Natural Resources PhD candidate to compare hydrological dynamics at sites with healthy hemlocks and HWA infested hemlocks. And this student is looking very, very closely at sites mainly in the Catskills that have these really healthy hemlock stands and stands that are really, really heavily infested and maybe not so healthy or, or are in really great decline. And we are looking at the differences between those two sites in terms of stream flashiness, which would indicate after a large rain event areas that might be more at risk for flooding and so we're seeing if there is an impact um, with hwa infestation and if that would lead to more flood prone um, flood prone areas and and the study sites for that again are in the catskill mountains right now so next i'm going to talk about ways that you can get involved with any hemlock lily adelgid projects the first thing I want to talk about is knowing your PRISM, or Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. As far as I know, New York State is the only state that has a PRISM system, and we are really, really lucky to live in a place that takes invasive species research 
and management so seriously. You guys, uh, anyone who's in the LGLC service area is likely in the Adirondack prism. And they call themselves APIP. Um, it stands for Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program, but they work with all invasives, plant or animal, um, terrestrial or aquatic, uh, it's a really excellent resource to get to know every invasive species that may be infesting your area. And the way that you can get involved with their projects is to visit their website, adkinvasives.com. Next, I wanna talk about projects that you can take on if you're a landowner. So if you own land in the Adirondacks or elsewhere, one way that you can get involved is help find your hemlock trees. So know where they are, uh, so that you know what's at risk. Next, survey for HWA on those hemlock trees and see if you have HWA on your property. And then if you wish, treat any infestations that you find. If you're located within the blue line, there may be special cases where the state will pay to have your trees treated for you because you're ultimately treating that whole area that is protected. Uh, but in any case, Treatment is a really, really excellent way to save your trees in the short term and keep them on the landscape in the long term. If you're a member of the community, maybe you don't own land, maybe you're, you spend your summers up in the Adirondacks, maybe you let, just love hiking and going everywhere around the, the Adirondacks, Go to areas with hemlock trees and honestly if you can find an area in the Adirondacks that doesn't have hemlock trees I mean good luck like good luck not finding a place that has hemlock trees they're everywhere can't throw a rock without hitting one in the Adirondacks so this is a really easy step to just go to places where hemlock trees are and survey for HWA always be vigilant and looking out for these bugs and then if you find it please report any in HWA infestations that you find. It is so critically important in this region. I have a few survey tips. So if you're going out and you're looking for HWA, the best time to survey is November through May because that's when you're going to see those white woolly masses on the tree. Next, consider tree health. So if you see a tree that has a dead branch or you know, doesn't look so healthy, maybe prioritize that tree and survey it first. If you're in a place where the canopy is really high and you don't have any branches within reach, look on the ground and see if there are any branches and that may give you an idea of what's happen happening up in that canopy. However, it's always easiest to survey trees with the branches in reach. It's also really helpful for HWA to look at the undersides of twigs and branches. If you can kind of see the photo behind, behind this slide, um, that's the underside of those twigs where you can see those two distinct white stripes on the needles. Uh, they tend to clump on the underside of the twig and so it can be really helpful to flip the twig up and, and get a look at the bottom of it. It's also really critical to check branches on all sides of a tree. So as I mentioned earlier, HWA is a really spotty insect and it only takes that one individual to start an infestation. And it can start anywhere on the tree, wherever that first crawler lands. And so if you check a tree on the a branch on the north side of the tree, but you didn't check the south side and maybe the infestation started on that south side of the tree, you might get a false negative. So it can be helpful to check as many branches as you can on all sides of a tree when you're doing a survey. If you are a boater or an angler, you're out on the water, there are some survey tips for you as well. First, keep an eye out for any ghost trees. So these trees that have this grayish appearance um, kind of look like they're haunting the shore. And check for a lack of new buds. So we just kind of passed the point, although you can still kind of see it, uh, where HWA, or excuse me, hemlock trees have these really bright, lime green new buds that look like this. Uh, this is typically kind of end of May and into June. They will have all their new growth in the spring will have these really bright lime green tips. And if you see a tree during that time that doesn't have those lime green tips, that might be a hemlock that's in a little bit of trouble. There might be something that's preventing that new growth. And so that would be a tree I would prioritize for surveying. So what you want to see is a hemlock tree with this nice healthy crown, green foliage with new buds on it. So no dead branches, nothing like that, versus something like this. 
So an unhealthy hemlock, a tree with an HWA infestation, is going to have a declining crown, so it's starting to lose its needles. Maybe it has some dead branches, lack of new growth, and pale grayish foliage. So HWA infestations aren't going to cause yellowing or browning of needles. What you'll be looking for is that pale grayish ghostly appearance. Next, if you find HWA, it is absolutely critical to report those infestations. There are a couple ways you can do this. The first is by using the New York Eye Map Invasives mobile phone app. And this is a really great way to do it because it's a program that's run out of the DEC's Natural Heritage Program. And so that will immediately let every land manager in the region know exactly where an infestation is. And you can find out more about it on the IMAP website. However, there are other ways you can do that. You can also report using the New York State Hemlock Initiative's Report HWA Finding Tool, which is available on our website. Or you can call the DEC directly using their Forest Pest Information Line at 866-640-0652. And they will, get, they will ask you, walk you through some questions about where you, you saw your HWA sighting. Um, so that they can go check it out. Again, in the Adirondacks, HWA has only been found once, and right now that infestation is considered treated. And so every single infestation reported in the Adirondacks would be huge news. So it's absolutely critical to continue those surveys and report any infestations that you find as soon as you can so that we can respond rapidly and slow the spread in the region. So a few final thoughts before I, before I say goodbye today. The first is that we cannot rely on cold winter temperatures to beat back HWA populations and control HWA mortality. Right now, HWA is still spreading. So even though New York's winters are cold and do have times where HWA populations get knocked back, we can't rely on them to save our hemlock trees. Um, especially in areas like the Adirondacks that have so many such dense, beautiful hemlock stands. Second, surveys and treatments are absolutely critical for keeping hemlocks healthy and on the landscape in the short term for the long term. And biocontrol is the way we are adapting and moving forward. So unfortunately, HWA is considered established on the East Coast. It's here and it's not going away. And so biocontrol is the solution to this problem of HWA, where we need something that can be long-term and landscape scale. And so biocontrol research will move us forward um, into the future of HWA management. So thank you all for allowing me to participate in the LGLC Living Land Series. Thank you for, to our partners at Lake George Land Conservancy. You guys are awesome. I wish I could have come see you guys in person again, uh, but thank you for having me on this webinar. If you wanna find out more information about Hemlock Willie Adelgid and the research taking place with the New York State Hemlock Initiative, you can visit us online at www.nyshemlockinitiative.info. You can also find us on Facebook and on Instagram, and you can email us directly any HWA question that you have at nyshemlockinitiative at cornell.edu. Thank you so much. Have a great day and keep your eyes on the trees. <laughs>